Nelson Figueroa, who does a great job pre- and post-game analyst for the New York Mets. Of course, a uh, former major leaguer himself. Uh, also teammates of uh, Roy, kind enough to join us for a couple moments. Don't forget, you can follow him on Twitter, at FigSNY in New York as well. So, uh, Nelson, I appreciate a couple moments. Uh, unfortunately, didn't want him under these circumstances, but appreciate you uh, joining me for a couple moments on a Friday. Understandable. Thank you so much, Rich. Uh, listen, uh, you know, the first, first of all, you know, when, when, when you... When you heard of this news, to me, it was, a, it was a punch in the gut. Like, sometimes, you know, when something happens, you kind of take a double take and you don't want it to be real. I'm just curious, you know, that, that first instant reaction to you, and I'm sure it just had to be a punch in the gut as well. Yeah, it, it's not one of the names you would expect to see something like this happening with. And, and that's so young, at only 40 years old. Um, you know, he was not one of those guys in the clubhouse, uh, you know, or in life that was a thrill seeker. He did not have the, you know, souped up, uh, thousand horsepower car to drive to the ballpark. He wasn't that guy. He was, uh, just, he was a master of his craft and just seems like uh, what the work he would put into his pitching, I can imagine the preparation he did in his flying. It wasn't haphazard. It wasn't something he took lightly. It wasn't something that he would do. It, yes, there's a thrill, of course, in just flying, but I, don't, I can't imagine him not checking all the boxes and taking all the necessary precautions to make sure that something like this didn't happen and accidents do happen. So to see his name with it, it was an uh, unbelievable shock. Yeah, and, and I remember when the Phillies made uh, uh, the, the trade, the move, and, and, and going into 2010 and then 2011, 2012, uh, because I was uh, uh, on the air at another station, so I was able to at least cover about 25 to 30 games. And I think I maybe covered uh, maybe three or four times that he pitched at home. And you can speak more to this. To me, you're talking about a guy, and I remember he told me this on the air. He's like, look, Rich, I'm always trying to perfect my craft. I remember what, throwing warm-up pitches. He was throwing warm-up pitches with purpose. I mean, he was just, you know, to me, that kind of separates the good ones from the great ones, where he always had that great control, but he, he was soaked in sweat. I mean, you're just talking about sometimes guys are a little lackadaisical their approach, but you saw that intensity there. It just seemed like he always had that intensity, the passion, and he was always trying to throw that perfect pitch. Yeah, people always talk about starting pitchers as only having to work once every five days. That was the exact opposite. He got to play once every five days. The other four days he spent honing his craft and, and, and just attempting to get as close to perfect as humanly possible. I sat there on many occasions, and, and Rich Doobie, who was the pitching coach yep. for us at the time, would say, hey, you got to come and watch Doc. Come and watch what Doc does, and I would go into the bullpen and watch his bullpens and watch him as he got towards the end of his bullpen and it was time to kind of do game situations and he's working with the catcher and the catcher would put down a, you know, a slider down and away. He would say, well, where exactly do you want it to end up? And he's like, I want it two inches off the corner. He'd throw a pitch, it would be two and a half to three inches off the corner. He goes, no, nope, let's do it again. It's got to look more like a strike. It can't be a ball out of my hand. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. And would continuously do it till he had that slider breaking the two inches that he wanted. And it wasn't just to hit it one time and get lucky at it. He'd do it again and again. And it just everyone that was involved was just in awe because it's one thing to practice it. It's another thing to perfect it. And that's what he always wanted to do. Those four, de those four days in between starts, there was no one like him that worked as hard as he did with purpose when everything that he did. I went back because I was taking notes and I was looking uh, back at uh, game one of the NL uh, Divisional Series. His first postseason start, tosses no hitter against the Reds, four nothing, walks one, strikes eight, uh, strike out, uh, strikes out eight. And you saw the great pl uh, play by uh, Chooch at the plate, uh, the little dribbler of uh, Phillips is bad. And, you know, it, it, it's amazing the crowd, the energy, the juice. Uh, in, in, in that in that ballpark, that had to be something an electric, and it's amazing. The guy's first career postseason start, and what does he do? He just goes out and throws a no-no. Yeah, you always say, hey, keep it the same, right? Do what you've been doing. Well, <laughs> that's kind of what he had been doing, always flirting with a no-hitter or a per perfect game because when he was on, he was just that on. Um, so to, to rise to those occasions, that's what the great ones do. I, I, I don't think there was anybody – anybody in the game that you would want to have on the mound and because he wasn't just on the mound for five innings 
you knew when he got on the mound it was going to be for nine. The only other person that might come in would be the closer in a situation where you were up three runs. Then right. it's like, okay, let's give it to the closer. We're up three. But if it was a one-run ball game, I don't think there's anybody you would rather have in the game than Roy cleaning up his own mess, as he would call it, and, and really how messy did it ever get. I, was, I sat back as the long guy, and uh, we'd be in the bullpen, and it's, okay, Roy's, <laughs> pitching, Roy's pitching today. Well, we got the day off. Let's watch. You know, and he was just that special. And I, I think one of the things that people don't realize is that, yes, it's when you're that, that superstar and you're that caliber of pitcher, that everybody kind of looks up to you, and, and they try to see exactly what you do. He was looking up to a guy like Jamie Moyer, Whose longevity he yeah, wanted absolutely. to try and have at forty six, you know, he was forty four years old when he was with us with the Phillies, and he was still going out there and challenging people. And he would he would ask Jamie, "How do you throw your changeup?" He's like, "I want to know," because Jamie Moyer would challenge people with a changeup. It, it sounds crazy, but that was his pitch. So instead of rearing back and throwing 100 miles an hour, I'm going to challenge you with my best fastball. I'm going to challenge you with my best changeup and a hitter's count. Let's see if you can change your game to, to match mine. And so Roy would play catch with him. He didn't play catch with anybody. He played catch with Jamie Moyer. And here he is, and they're going back and forth. And he's trying to learn, you know, how they slide or cutter. And he added it to his game. So he was helping Jamie Moyer out at 44 years old and also learning how to throw the changeup. And that's just the kind of person he was. He was a perfectionist. He wanted to be the best he could possibly be. At 12.28 on a Friday, Rich Quinones here, Middays with Q on 97.3 ESPN FM. Nelson Figueroa does a great job pre- and post-game analyst for the New York Mets on SNY. And again, give him a, a follow on Twitter at Fig SNY. Of course, former league uh, former leaguer uh, pitcher as well with um, uh, Milwaukee, the Mets, uh, Houston, the Phils. Uh, we'll get into the NL East, talk a little baseball in a second. But, you know, to me, the complete game, especially when we're talking about generational pitchers, it is somewhat of a lost art from what we saw in the 60s and 70s and even to some extent in the 80s. But for a guy like Roy to go out and to throw so many complete games in his career, it just that, that speaks volumes to me as a guy that, hey, listen, it's not five or six you're going to pull me. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to get – you're going to have to work for 27 outs. Yeah, no, he he was a the constant professional when it came to that. I think the only other person at, at that time of you know for that four year span, say where Roy was just locked in as can be, uh, he uh, CC Sabathia comes to mind. And CC was doing it to pitch for a contract. Right, of everyone course. knew that. Yep. Everyone knew he wanted to be out there, and he was going to show that his value was was that he wasn't just a five inning pitcher. He was a left handed pitcher do what Roy Halladay could do, and he did it until he got that contract, and then all of a sudden he became a little bit more specialized, had a better bullpen with the Yankees and the whole nine yards. But I think for Roy Halladay was, I'm the best pitcher on this mound today, and I'm going to be the only pitcher on this mound. And he just, he admitted, uh, that that was something he admitted, it, it, it was something that permeated through the rest of the staff. I think it made every pitcher, every starter that we had in Philadelphia, want to be like, okay, if Roy's doing it, I want to do it as well. So that bullpen at times was so well-rested. It was like, how do we get into games? Yeah. Myself as a long man, I went, I went 18 games without getting into a ball game. You were getting bored out there. Oh my God, I'm sitting out there, and then I finally get a chance to go in a game. We go into extra innings, and I pitch three innings. We win the ball game in a walk-off home run by Brian Schneider, and Charlie Manuel comes over, and he goes, this guy hasn't pitched in 18 days, and he's throwing strikes, and he's challenging people. He goes, this is my guy, and he gives me a big hug. And I was like, that's the kind of team that, because of what Roy established at the top, he changed the face of that franchise in, in, those, in, those, in those years because a guy like Cole Hamels was the leader. He yes. was the number one. He was the chosen one. He got bumped all the way back. By 2011, he was bumped all the way back to the number four starter. And Which is it, crazy when you think about it because of the career that Cole Hamels has had. And a lot of times he never just really got the run support. Absolutely, and I think that was the thing was that Cole was like, I'm not a number four pitcher. I'm a number one pitcher. I happen to be around these great pitchers as well, but he always could hold his own. But he he rose, he rose, changed himself and rose, his game rose to another level because of pitcher like Roy Halladay, Roy Oswald, and Cliff Lee. And now all of a sudden you're talking about it's no longer, you know, it's, it's no longer just him by himself 
taking on the National League East. All of a sudden, now they've got these other three stud starters, and Cole Hamels now can play an even bigger part in it, being the number four starter in this rotation. I saw that you retweeted something from The Athletic that Doc made at a point going back to the 2011 SI cover where everyone was, uh, they were labeling uh, that starting rotation of four aces, and uh, they said, come in, uh, come in, uh, Roy, and, and, and Cole Hamels, I guess, said it, and I guess they were waiting for Joe Bland, and he's like, no, no, it's the five aces. You know, it, it's, it tells me that's, that's, that's a guy you want to be in the trenches with if you want to go to battle with oh without a doubt and i think that's another thing is that as the fifth starter with a guy like roy being the ace and wanting to keep him on his rotation of every fifth day you knew when you had a day off that hey you had to sacrifice yourself because he was going to be pitching on your day as a fifth starter he he understood that and 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 that excluding somebody like Joe Blanton wasn't going to be good for the staff. It it was about, he he was the consummate leader of a staff. That's what you'd want an ace to do. The ace doesn't, and a lot of guys, when they're aces, they're the prima donnas of the rotation, right? They're the guys that get taken care of the most and and everybody loves them and lavishes them. But he wasn't that guy. He was the workhorse who wanted to include everyone else in on that journey. And so by him doing that and saying, hey, you know what? I'm not taking the picture. We're not taking the picture until it's all five of us because it's a five-man rotation, and he's going to get his due as well. And I, 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 again, take my hat off to the man because of, of times like that, and there's so many other examples of, of how he always thought about the team more so than himself. But that one day a week, man, we all watched him and knew what he could do all by himself. Yeah, and you know what? It makes a manager's job that much more easier. You just kind of Absolutely. sit back and you kind of marvel. Again, a couple minutes with uh, former Major League pitcher Nelson Figueroa. Again, pre- and post-game analyst, New York Mets on SNY. Give him a uh, follow on Twitter at Fig SNY. All right, let me just, uh, before I let you get out of here, be remiss about the NL East. This is, listen, you're talking about, major shakeup now. You got three rookie managers. You got Martinez in Washington, Kapler in Philly. You got Callaway uh, in New York. You got Derek Jeter now, uh, uh, you know, uh, an all-time great owner of the Marlins. Uh, Again, listen, the Mets are the Mets. Uh, Washington's got some issues. Miami's still a young team. We saw Atlanta win a couple games, but Man, you look at the NL East going into the uh, to, to to the off season, hot stove baseball into the winter, and then going into next year. I mean, it's amazing. Three rookie managers. Um, is it still Washington's uh, division to win? I think it's Washington's division until noted elsewise. The Mets got in at the right time in 15 and 16 where, you know, a bunch of injuries happen. When injuries happen, that's the biggest thing in baseball and, and how deep your roster is because you can have the superstar player, but if the superstar player is then going to be replaced by a double-A kid, then you're out of luck when that superstar goes down. I think that is the lesson that's been learned over the past four years since the Mets went to the World Series. You've seen the Nationals come back and, and rise to greatness because even though they went out and made great moves, Adam Eaton, that he got hurt early in the season. They had a guy like Michael Taylor to replace him and did a great job. You had a guy like you know Bryce Harper go down with a knee injury, yep. and he was able to sit out, and they still cruised to the championship, you know, the NL East championship. Uh, but, uh, other guys really stepped up in a major way, and so that's what you have to make sure of now. You have to make sure that that replacement player isn't just okay. You want him to be a major league starter anywhere else, but be able to be on your bench and still have the, uh, uh, his ego in check enough to know that I'm going to keep preparing and be ready for when my opportunity comes. It might not be now, it might not be next year, but I want to be a part of a winning team. So to get a guy a buy-in like that, I think the Nationals have done a great job of that. But Dusty's no longer there. So now... Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Do you I, I'm curious, do you think they just... Listen, his track record in the playoffs, it's it, it's been rough, to be honest. But the talent they have on the field, I don't think that franchise has ever been the same. I think there's been that dark light since they decided uh, to shut down Strasbourg years ago. Yeah, that's kind of that the, the one moment that you I sure eats at, at the GM. He's still thinking all these times of what if, what if. You never want to have a what if. You don't want to have a regret moment. And you think, oh, well, it'll be one of many and we'll be back. Man, how many franchises have said that, that, you know, this is just the beginning of the dynasty and then it never happens again. I, I think you see in baseball these last few World Series of winners, the Chicago Cubs, 108 years, you know, you had Cleveland yep. getting back there for the first time in, you know, 48 years. It, it doesn't happen as often as you think, and no matter how good your ball club is built on paper, things happen. The Mets learned the hard way this year, where it was World Series or bust 
with the expectations, and then you realize in May, oh my God, we have Injuries. to find a way to stay afloat. Yeah. We've got to find more pitching. We have to find more players. We don't. We don't have enough. You never have enough. There's never enough. You have to find ways to to be resourceful. You have to find ways to be able to, uh, you know, be resilient with injuries and then the preparation because it is a long season and no matter what uh, we saw how many times the teams come out the gate the first two months of the season they're you know leading the division by 10 games what was cincinnati reds yep nobody took that for real everybody's like oh God, wow this is surprising and then i think it was a matter of two weeks they were seven games out so it happens in baseball i think you have to learn these things as a player and as a manager and as front office and kind of put all these things into consideration when building your rosters and looking forward to the next year. But again, the Nationals are the front runner right now. They're still the deepest team. They're still the most accomplished team. And, and when you've had that recent success, you still have that edge. You still have that confidence as well. Uh, before I let you get out of here, what, 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 what do you think about the Phillies? They hire Kapler. He's, a, he's an analytical guy, uh, preparation. You know, I, I made the joke on the air. We had their assistant GM, uh, Scott Profrock, on. I mean, if anything, this is going to be like one of the rippest and most uh, conditioned teams out there because because this guy is a health and nutritional nut. But again, player personnel with the Dodgers, feisty player, long time uh, in the bigs, but recently removed. And I think that's the, that's, that's the route they wanted to go. You know, you can have all the passion and intensity of the world, but it doesn't necessarily... You can't... You What I'm trying to say, you can't always put your heart into some of your players. So I, I'm curious to see how this plays out. Yeah, you know, I, I know Gabe Kapler well. I've, I've played against him all the way up. I've, I've, we know each other's history. And that, to me, um, the game is changing. What a manager's role is is changing. What the front office role is, is has changed. Even ownership has kind of changed because the ownership is now kind of putting it in that front office's hands. They're saying, hey, you build the team not just by players but the analytics department. Now we have to find a way to get the analytics down to the players and make them understand why we're doing what we're doing. Yeah. Guys, when I was coming up and when Kapler was coming up, if you wanted to be a Major League Baseball player and you wanted to be a, a starting Major League Baseball player, you were going to have to play 162 games. That's what you prepared for, that's what you grinded at, and that's what you said, you know what, the ups and downs of a season with the highs and lows, they will all average out, and I will be okay. It doesn't work that way anymore because with the analytics, what you're doing is you're trying to maximize what a guy is good at or, or, or what his specialty is. And this is not just in bullpen where you have the you know traditional lefty-righty matchup, but now you're looking at, at players, position players. And platooning isn't just platooning where it used to be, okay, lefty-righty, and that was an old-school type of thing. Platooning is coming back in a big way because what it is is setting up the lineup differently, giving you the best matchups, giving you a chance to take all those numbers and put them in play and give a guy a better chance to be successful. However, when you're only specializing in doing one thing, and I relate this to a guy like Wilmer Flores, mm -hmm. we always hear about him, oh, he crushes left-handed pitching, crushes left-handed pitching, and then all of a sudden there's righties in there, and you forget how to hit righties. You didn't forget how to hit righties because you made it to the major leagues by hitting righties, right. but because you become so specialized, it becomes a little bit more difficult because you're not used to doing it, you're not used to seeing it, so it, it hurts the player. But at the same time, if you have a lefty that crushes righties, then it helps the team because you're being able to put a guy who's really good at hitting righties in the lineup. But you have to now get that player who wanted 162 to buy into only being a guy who plays maybe 100, maybe only 81 games where you split it evenly down the middle. That's a difficult thing to do because when those guys have put up their numbers, they go to free agency, they go to arbitration, they no longer have those numbers like the guys previously. And that's what arbitration and free agency is based off of, precedented numbers, right? Absolutely. Everybody is paid off those numbers. Now those books are going to be turned upside down, and I think we've already seen that. We just saw a guy who hit 41 home runs a year ago in Chris Carter get a $3 million deal. 41 home runs, Danny Tartable got – $40 million for four years. So this is what I'm saying is that everything is now, the numbers yeah. are being turned upside down and the front office's ownership, everything is being turned upside down for the numbers. And now it becomes a matchup game. Athletes are going to have to find ways to become athletes in a different capacity. And I think Gabe Kapler brings that side of it because of the phenomenal athlete that he's always been and leading by example in that area and being able to talk about his experiences of success and failure. He's going to have to figure out a way to tell his lefty-righty matchups, hey, you're not playing today. I know you had two hits yesterday and a home run to win the game. But I'm going to, yep. 
I got to sit you down today. It's better for the team. But be ready because stay hot and stay ready because they're going to bring in a lefty in the seventh inning when the starter comes out after, you know, or really the sixth inning after five and a third because that's all they do now. I need you ready. I need you that focus. I need you that, that, that same, same intensity to help us win a ball game in the sixth inning, and then that's when you take over. Yeah. So it, I think that's where Gabe Kapler is a tremendous choice. Yeah, and it's, I tell you what, it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make for a very interesting uh, baseball season, especially uh, from uh, our standpoint on Sports Talk, because you know what happens. Oh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. On, you're in the New York market. It, it, Are you kidding me? We're going to see a lot of that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nelson, uh, I can talk baseball with you all day. I appreciate a couple of moments, and I appreciate a couple of uh, moments uh, reflecting on Roy. Uh, and keep up the great work with SNY. We'll certainly talk along the way. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Rich. All right. You got it, Nelson Figueroa, pre- and post-game analyst for uh, New York Mets on SNY. Follow him on Twitter, FigSNY. Uh, very good stuff.